On the ballot this November, should Washington utilities, including Seattle City Light, be required to invest in renewable energy, especially wind power? On the ballot this November, should Washington utilities, including Seattle City Light, be required to invest in renewable energy, especially wind power? Ready? Mm -hmm. Three, two, one. On the ballot this November, should Washington utilities. Three, two, one. On the ballot this November, should Washington utilities, including Seattle City Light, be required to invest in renewable energy, especially wind power? Was wind power? Um. Let's do it one more time. Three, two, one. On the ballot this November, should Washington utilities, including Seattle City Light, be required to invest in renewable energy, especially wind power? Felt fine. Okay, I think it was fine. Three, two, one. You, you did look a little bit. Well, I kind of did something weird on wind power. Three, let me do it one more time. <laughs> okay. Three, two, one. On the ballot this November, should Washington utilities, including Seattle City Light, be required to invest in renewable energy, especially wind power? That felt good. That felt good. Okay. Three, two, one. Indeed, that's the main dynamic in the Initiative 937 debate, whether higher electric rates are justified to make Washington utilities. You, you sounded a lot louder before you said Three, two, one. Indeed, that's the main dynamic in the Initiative 937 debate, whether higher electric rates are justified to make Washington utilities greener. Three, two, one. Here's what I-93... Three, two, one. Here's what I-937 would do. It would mandate that public and private utilities in Washington obtain at least 15% of their energy from renewable resources. There's a deadline. They must do it by 2020. And just what counts as renewable, according to the initiative, wind, solar, and biomass, among other alternatives. Did you want to say that one a little faster? Yep. Okay. Three, two, one. Here's what I-937 would do. It would mandate that public and private utilities in Washington obtain at least 15% of their energy from renewable resources. And there's a deadline. They must do it by 2020. Just what counts as renewable, according to the initiative, wind, solar, and biomass, among other alternatives. I got that too. Okay. I, I like the snowy. Three, two, one. Gina London coordinates the No on 937. I'm going to say No on 937. Three, two, one. Gina London coordinates the No on 937, the No on 937 campaign. Three, two, one. Gina London coordinates the No on 937 campaign. So I, Mindy. I don't want to do I. That's okay. All right. Three, two, one. Jean Godden, a 937 supporter, is a member of the Seattle City Council. Three, two, one. And then there's the question. Three, two, one. And then there's the question of just how much of this trend is already happening without a mandate. Three, two, one. And then there's the question of just how much of this. Just how much this trend, yeah. Three, two, one. And then there's the question of just how much this trend is already happening without a mandate. Three, two, one, final VO. Three, two, one. How much will I-937 raise rates? How important is green power to the environment? Is the alter... I think raise rates, like there's something that sounded funny. Three, two, one. How much will I-937 really raise rates? How important is green power to the environment? Is the alternative trend already upon us? Voters will have the final say when I-937, the Renewable Energy Initiative, appears on the November ballot. Listen, okay.
very sharp today. Well, I'm this going looks... to the police ball tonight. Oh, the yeah. police ball. I yeah. didn't, do they have a ball? Yeah. Okay. Like the guild has a ball. This is the foundation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, no wonder you're all. You bet. I just yeah. say, that is a really nice tie. Yeah. Oh, the, so you're much. you're looking as sharp Thank as you. I've ever all seen right. you. So, amen. <laughs> I thought about actually putting the mic up tight because that makes it a little closer to where your voice oh. was tonight. But then I realized, you know, I just can't do that. We don't want to ruin that tie. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, let me let me start with actually the planning department staff. Where if we are rolling, uh, what's the what's the importance of giving the council more of a role in in appointing planning commission members? Sure. Well, the planning commission is there to advise the mayor and council on important citywide planning issues. So the feeling there is that if they're there for both the mayor and council, then we should have some appointing authority with the members, so that they don't think their only duty is to the mayor. And this would what give you give you the council uh, the power over half the appointments? That's correct. Is that the status now with the design commission, which people think of as kind of a similar body? No, the design commission is also appointed by the mayor. However, the design commission is not mentioned in the city charter, and it is part of our longer term plan to re to consider making. Uh, changes to boards and commissions in other areas, including the Design Commission and the Parks Commission, for example. To so. give council more, more sane appointees. Authority. That's correct. To but split it up, to balance it equally between mayor and council, so that they're, they're, it's clear that they're there to serve both legislative and executive branches of government, as well as the general public. In terms of all the boards and commissions, would this, I don't know how many there are, a dozen, let's say, would this be kind of the first one that would have joint appointment if it passes, or is that, do we have that model in some of the others? They're all mixed up. Uh, they're all over the place. So, but we've, look, we've looked selectively at some of the key boards and commissions in city government that are supposed to be the voice of the community and the bridge with community. But it starts to break down if there's a political loyalty to the mayor which we've seen in the past. <laughs> That's a good soundbite. <laughs> what about the, the argument that you have the power to confirm or reject all these mayoral appointees? In other words, the council does have a role now in the Planning Commission, doesn't it? We do. We have the power. In fact, we do confirm all of the mayor's appointees, but it's not the same thing as naming the individual, selecting naming the individual and it having an ongoing relationship with that appointee. That's very important. And often um, we do tend to, you know, confirm the mayor's nominees and you would have to have a very egregious reason. You'd have to have a you know, very strong and compelling reason not to confirm someone. You'd have to find them just disqualified or incompetent to serve. That doesn't happen very often. So there is real value in the selection process and the designation of the appointee and having that better balance between mayor and council. Isn't it confusing, and some will cer certainly make this argument, that when you start dividing authority, for instance, with the Planning Commission if this, if this Charter Amendment wins, or with Charter Amendment 8 where you start adding the council's voice and reconfirmation of, of cabinet level positions, don't you start dividing authority and making it harder to run city government? No. The council already has confirmation authority over all department heads and has reconfirmation of now 10 department heads every four years. So what we're attempting to achieve is uniformity, consistency, and public accountability to the reconfirmation process. And it's maintaining a healthy balance of power between the executive and legislative functions of government to serve the public best. You don't think this will create gridlock? Absolutely not, no. Why not include police and fire? I believe you fought for that. Well, I support adding police and fire to the reconfirmation process. All department heads should be held accountable to the public. And if we don't have review powers in terms of reconfirmation every four years, uh, they could go on indefinitely and uh, the public may not be well served. Uh, without that level of check-in and we're just asking for four years of check-in every four years on key you know high-level uh, issues of performance so uh, the argument was made that police and, and and fire are somehow different police and fire are you know that public safety potentially could be compromised if the council intervenes with a, a reconfirmation process I emphatically disagree with that uh, they are uh, uh, responsible to the public and we need to hold them accountable just like all the other department heads. 
It has been it has been called a power grab by the council. What's your response to that? Well, number one, the charter is very clear that the, all department heads report directly to the mayor. No one disputes that. The day-to-day -day functions, the day-to-day -day work programs, the goal setting, the priorities, that's in the mayor's purview. And I can tell you that the nine council members, including myself, are very busy individuals. And our concerns are with writing laws, developing good public policy, but also providing a level of oversight and a check and balance in the branches of government to best serve the public. And that's what this is about, is to ensure that there's adequate level of oversight. Do you believe that right now, without these charter amendments, there is not enough check on a strong mayor? We have a strong mayor, strong council system in Seattle. It's not one way, and it's not lopsided. The council has budget authority, we have policy making authority, and we cannot function in a vacuum. We cannot allow ourselves to be marginalized by total control by the executive of the department heads and, and their, uh, their staff. We have got to work collaboratively. And at times, I can tell you, it, it is very frustrating when we don't have their cooperation. Do you think this will help ensure more mayoral cooperation with the council? I sure hope so, and I expect it will. And I think that's why the public should vote, that why the voters should approve these charter amendments. In, in a broad brush, how would you describe there are 11 of them on the ballot? Are they, are they housekeeping some, technical some? How do you describe these for voters? Well, we had an extensive public process in vetting these issues. Every year we consider possible charter amendments. Charter amendments can only be made by a vote of the people. And so we could propose these amendments, but ultimately it's up to the voters to decide. So as part of that process this year, I was named the chair of an ad hoc committee for charter amendments. We drew uh, suggestions from the city clerk's office, uh, from the general public, from certain community organizations, and from council members. The mayor chose not to submit any charter amendments uh, for, the pro for, for our consideration. So they come from a number of different places. Some are, in fact, technical updating of the city's charter where there is old antiquated language or, or provisions that no longer apply such as the city comptroller we don't have one anymore and so we're cleaning up that language but we're also trying trying to iron out some of our processes and ensure that things like during an emergency we can effectively um, continue government and if if our city hall might be blown up or collapsed or or inoccupiable we need to have the uh, the legal authority to relocate in an emergency. So one charter amendment would do just that. It would allow us to conduct business pursuant to state law at another location. Is this almost a response to terrorism? I mean, making it, making it more relevant to, to this era? Well, it's thinking ahead and being mindful of, you know, the risk that exists and the potential threats that exist in the world. We want to be fully prepared here in Seattle. Do we have someone over here? No. Oh, someone was just smiling at you. Um, no, it was me. I was just a little horrified by the idea. Oh, <laughs> of, of City Hall coming down? Okay. <laughs> Sonia's all worried well, about Well, it almost came down a few years ago, the old one. <laughs> okay. We came close to being squashed in that old building. I, oh, because of what? The was, earthquake. The Nespali oh, okay, quake okay, in okay. the old okay. municipal building right where we stand. Today. That was such a trash <laughs> building. Um, in terms of yeah. in terms of the auditor, explain to people what the auditor is and why the charter amendment about the auditor is important. Sure. Well, first of all, the city auditor is currently appointed by the finance chair of the Seattle City Council, works within the legislative branch of government, and has a small um, staff of about 13 people, and they have a fair degree of independence, as they should, to independently examine the city's finances, city departments, um, performance issues, not just financial, but other issues that might have to do with uh, the performance of a given department. Um, and they take their ideas from the council, from the mayor's office, from the general public, and they formulate their own work program. So in this uh, particular issue, uh, the city auditor would be appointed by the a majority of the full council as opposed to a single individual on the council, the finance chair, as it's currently written. So we feel that the city auditor's duty is to uh, the entire city council and ultimately to the public. And we want to broaden uh, the, um, 
the controls there. 11 is a lot of charter amendments. Was there a sense that we're, you were going to overwhelm voters <laughs> by, by throwing just so much at them? Well, I certainly hope not. I realize um, that it, it takes a little bit of study to uh, determine uh, what those charter amendments are about, but there's very broad public support for the charter amendments. In fact, there's some 22 organizations in Seattle have already officially taken a position of, of support for all 11 of them. Uh, there is some controversy over two or three of the charter amendments, but by and large, they were um, developed through a uh, very transparent and open community process and with a lot of thought put into them and, uh, and purpose. So I think the, the public would be well served by supporting all 11 charter amendments. Is this the kind of thing that what, do we do charter amendments kind of in batches about every three, four years? Well, the, the council takes up a review of the city's charter every year, but sometimes there aren't um, any changes to the charter. It has actually been amended 64 times since it was first adopted in 1947. So it's not uh, entirely unusual for us to be proposing charter amendments. This year there are a few more. Uh, we spent more time trying to, trying to do a, a, a larger overhaul to pick up things that really needed to be addressed. We've, as we have banging here on the county building, I hear it. But anyway, we're, we're, we're done here unless right, there's there any, what's, is there any sort of final thoughts you have? Anything you want to? Let me think. We've covered. You did very well covering the substantive <laughs> ones. The, you gave me some good sound bites. You gave me very good sound yeah, bites. Okay. You can, you're welcome to say anything more about the mayor if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all trying to do the best job we can here, the mayor and the council included. And obviously there's going to be some tension from time to time. And, you know, maybe, you know, there are little power struggles here and there, but by and large, I think the city is well served by the system of government we have. And it's very important that we have a healthy balance of power in city government. That's perfect, that's great. Thank you so much. Okay.